I have one of my good buddies from many, many years ago, Dr. Jason Powers. Say hi, Jace. Hi, Jace. <laughs> so Dr. Powers is a good buddy of mine. We go way back, and he has an interesting story, which hopefully he'll share with us. And uh, Jason is really one of the foremost experts on addiction and addiction medicine. Um, he has served as chief medical officer. What's the company that you're chief medical so officer of now? Now it's called Positive Recovery Centers. Positive Recovery Centers. And what do you guys do there? So we actually apply the new science of happiness, positive psychology, to, addic to the addictive space. So we believe that if people's lives are more rewarding than the promise of a relapse, the chances are higher they're going to stay sober. And we don't just pay lip service to like taking care of our people either. So, you know, we, we really consider our, our staff as much a client as any client is one of my patients. So it's That's a interesting. Yeah. So there's a, there's a science to happiness. Yeah. Positive psychology, dude. I got my master's in it at Penn. Remember 2012, I think. I do vaguely remember, but, um, but, but so because I talk a lot, I don't know, Jason, you know, but I'm, I'm constantly fighting about science versus, you know, alternative medicine and not having actual research. Um, so there is research behind positive psychology and addiction. Yes, absolutely. You totally don't listen to me when I talk to you. I, I told you you have to go do the program. It's not self-help. It's actually double blind placebo controlled trials. You would like it. So, so because everyone out there is, is we hear this things like positive psychology. We hear this all the time. W what is positive psychology? Like, what do you tell you? You're not telling your patient just be happy, right? No. Well, when most people hear happy, they think it's the online emotional experience, but there's a lot more to that. Remember uh, Aristotle's eudaimonia or eudaimonia? It's, it's well-being. So happiness is found in positivity, which is positive emotions like joy, contentment. This is what most people think is happiness, but that's just the P. It's also found in ERMA. So engagement is when you use your character strengths and everybody has 24, they're universal character strengths. When you engage them in such a fashion that they're challenged in the right amount where you enter that state of flow, it's optimal human action. R stands for relationships. And like by far the best predictor of happiness in the literature is the depth and breadth of one's um, you know, relationships. So PRM is meaning and purpose. This is where spirituality is. This is where faith is. But you don't have to have faith. Even you know, atheists, agnostics have sacred people and places and, they, and their lives are full of meaning. You know, there may not be meaning in life, but there's mean, sorry, there may not be meaning to life, but there's meaning in life. So it's a broad thing. And then A is achievement. And it's not achievement for God, for God glory. I'm thinking of the conquistadors. So it's not, it's not achievement for like winning for the sake of winning, but it's actually the peace of mind knowing you exerted your best effort in pursuing meaningful goals. So that's where you find human happiness. Oh yeah, it's outstanding. It's work of Carol Dweck and all these other people like mindset. Okay. T take me, take everybody back because they don't know your story. Because I want you to, I want you to tell everybody your story because I, I find it obviously it, it's fascinating. It was scary for me at times, uh, but I want you to go back to your story. But I also want you to reflect in that story. Were you unhappy? Does unhappiness drive or, or or depression? Is that driving addiction or does addiction drive depression? So both. So like everybody should learn before they die what they're running from and to and why. Right. And so, you know, happiness is the only thing that people pursue for itself. People pursue other things in order to be happy. Um, you either move towards something positive or away from something negative. So, yeah, man, I was I had a, I have ADHD pretty bad and wasn't medicated. And kids that have ADD um, that are medicated don't have a higher risk of addiction. But back, you know, we grew up, there was no ADD. There was a belt and like shame. So my nickname right. in preschool was Mr. Impatient. And man, it was like, it was torture because I'm not great at sitting still. Um, but people with ADD, we were, uh, we were advantageous to those of you who weren't because we would always notice like, not just a squirrel, but like the tiger. We'd be like, hey, what's that? Uh, so anyway, there's so many of us because it is advantageous for the whole, but be that as it may. Yeah. So born in Houston, friends with Garth since seventh grade, just reminiscing on how lucky I was to have him in my life when we were younger. 
up through I don't know when, but like we don't see each other so much anymore, which which is okay because like I don't you know when when we see each other, it's like no time has passed. Great guy, I mean, so many memories. Uh, okay, so yeah, like being unhappy, absolutely, because you know people are just gonna try to be happy, and if you go about it the wrong way, like me, um, you can develop addiction. And I had ADHD, like I said, depression. There's like so many things, you know. There was so much trauma in my house growing up. It was just so bad. And, um, you know, naturally, like it, not naturally, but like I come by it honestly. Like it, it's in my genes heavy. Food was my first addiction. Absolutely. Like I used to hide candy um, when I was a kid. I wanted to work at 7 Eleven because that's where the candy was, right? I mean, it, that was like not. Well, you were a pizza enough. delivery boy too. Dude, no, no, I'm talking like. It's five, six, seven, eight. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yeah, 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 man. Like, you know, sugar was like crack. And and you know how the brain operates. So it's it's like my drug of choice is more. It really doesn't matter what it is. Food, drugs, alcohol, sex, you know, you got it. Yeah, I, I didn't do heroin or cocaine. That's just because I was always afraid those would kill me. I knew like my, you know, I knew my tendency and I just didn't want to take the short route, right? I wanted the slow, painful route for death. <laughs> to me growing up when when I was with you, I never thought of you as unhappy or ADHD or did you know that you may be prone to addiction at an early age? Do people that are addicts know that early? Well, I had no clue, right? I mean, I didn't I have no, I had no idea. I didn't know what addiction was till I was a patient in rehab. So no, at that age absolutely not. The, you know, everybody in adolescence goes through social anxiety and all these other things. I mean, the happiest time of my childhood and growing up was when we were all together, right? Because I had like a stable pod. And a lot of us don't, a lot of patients I treat don't have that. So if you don't have like a stable home environment and you don't have stable friends, it's so, it's isolating and it's really bad. So, I mean, I was thriving, I feel like, when we were together a lot of the times, but I mean, Garth, I was stoned so much. Like I was stoned almost daily. Like, yeah, I can't believe you didn't know that. And then. Sort of like our, you know, in high school, everything was great. Everything was great. And then junior year and senior year, it was like, I tanked, man. I was like isolating. My grades went bad. You know, I stopped playing sports. And that was, that was too much. That was too, many, too much weed. We get to college. Remember my freshman year, I was like basically um, nocturnal, right? I like never went out during the day. Got a 2.0, which was like so hard to bring up if you're trying to get in med school. So sophomore year, I kind of got my shit together and then just basically drank like, you know, like college kids do, um, got in med school and, you know, you have to be sober a huge part of med school to make it through because it, it is ridiculously hard, especially for someone with ADD. Let, let me give a little bit of a, a introduction to Marcus. So Marcus and I go way back. When was it, Marcus, that you first came to see me in the office? Uh, like five years ago, I think, something like that. Right? Oh, really? I thought it was even longer. Uh, uh, maybe longer, six years ago. Yeah. Maybe seven. I sometimes look at obesity as an addiction. And so when I see a patient who comes to me and they've been overweight, you were upwards close to 500 pounds when I first saw you, and it had a lap band. Uh, and when I see someone with that kind of a situation, it, I, I start to think back about well, why do we have obesity to begin with? Were you overweight all your life? Yeah, pretty much, pretty much uh, from about probably 10, 11 years old, I was, um, I was, you know, you could just start telling the weight was kind of going to be a problem. Both my parents were pretty, uh, uh, pretty big themselves. You know, um, my mom, uh, my dad wasn't quite as, uh, ha he didn't really have a problem that I did or mom did, but we, it was kind of genetically. So it's kind of like a, uh, what do you call it? You know, you thought it was your life sentence, you know, of like, Hey, I'm just going to be big, you know? Uh, yeah. so, and you know, we're, we're, we're from the South. So my dad was a preacher and just, it all revolved around food. He was a, he was a gourmet chef and, you know, and that was, that's what he did it like as his hobby. And, um, uh, uh, it was just kind of a, Hey, I'm just going to be big, better deal with it. You know? Um, that's kind of how, that's how it kind of got out of control. You know, that's how, that's how the uh, the thought process went. Yeah, so it's interesting. I mean, we look at the statistics with obesity, and we look back. I mean, obesity in some ways 
is almost a normal, I, our bodies are made to hold on to food. Our bodies are, are made to drive us to eat because back in the old, you know, thousands of years ago when we were evolving, we were evolving during times of feast or famine. So we grew this huge stomach that could take a lot of food. We grew a propensity towards wanting to eat high calorie foods. And then of course you get into an environment where you grow up around a family who's cooking all the time. You've got these genes that predispose you to want that food and that food is plenty. There's no winter starvation. And so at what point did you feel like it was getting out of control? Probably uh, 15, 16 years old. I was like, uh Oh, this is not going to be good. You know, I'm just going to be big, you know? Um, and then, then it, you know, so, so I really did really couldn't play a lot in high school that, the, you know, I was more of the, uh, I was more into music and drama and singing. So, you know, I was getting my, you know, I was getting my, you know, uh, I guess, you know, the feeling of being successful through music and singing. And, you know, I, I mean, you know, I, I, I was winning all kind of awards and uh, I was trying to do, do the music deal. But then, you know, then you get into the music scene and then you realize I don't look I don't look anything like the people that are, you know, superstars, you know. Uh, how, how, you know, how is that going to work? You know, it was before the voice and the turn, the chairs and, you know, all the stuff like that. It wasn't about the, what about the talent? It was about the look, you know? And so, you know, just decided, Hey, I'm just going to try to make a difference in this world. You know, I became a youth pastor, went to Bible college, that kind of thing. And, uh, still just big, you know, got married when I was, uh, 21, been married, uh, 20, eight years, 27 years, something like that. I think 28 years, 20, yeah, 26 years. I don't know. It's one of those years, but long. You better figure that out, buddy. Yeah. I asked my wife before the deal. I was like, Hey, how many years? She's like, you tell me. I was like, Oh God, this is not going to be good if you listen. <laughs> but, um, but I took her to Italy for my 25th. So I'm, I'm, I'm good there. Right. <laughs> You're good there. Uh, yeah. So, you know, just married big, uh, started having kids, had, had four kids and, uh, started my first company with like five grand, never really had a drinking problem at all. Never. I did not take a sip drink of alcohol till I was 23, 24 years old. Uh, and didn't really like it. Didn't have a, you didn't have it, but I love Cokes. I love Sprites and I loved sugar. I, I mean, it was like he said, it was crack. You know, I, I was a, definitely a de addict to eating, you know I mean? Then, and then, you know, then I started making a little bit of money you know, and I didn't go to college. I hated school. Uh, never could be a medical doctor at all. Uh, if it takes, uh, takes what you guys did, I'm not doing that. But, um, uh, you know, kind of, kind of started my first company with just a little bit of money. And uh, then all of a sudden now I, I got into a little bit of money and then, then it wasn't like Red Lobster was the place to go. Then it was like, you know, Ibiza. And then it was, you know, Uchi and all the crazy places that you could really start thinking of. And, you know, I was VIP at all the places in town, uh, could bump a table anytime I wanted to come in and, uh, you know, drinking, started drinking big bottles of wine. And then it really became where I started kind of like, okay, I'm going to now personify the godfather of, you know, you know, this, whatever, you know, I'm going to pay for my fun. We're going to have friends and, but I couldn't do anything. I literally couldn't, couldn't tie my shoes, you know, couldn't had to take my shoe off to put it up on the counter to tie it. You know, I would, I would plan my days when I was working not to get out of the truck, you know, never did, never did a damn thing. I mean, never did nothing, you know, so came to you and, you know, if I'm going to have the surgery, I'm going to go find the best guy in the world, you know, and, um, he wasn't available when I found you. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah. I came to your, I, ca I came to your place and, uh, you know, here's this guy who's talking about plants all of a sudden. And I, I don't remember, but you tightened my band. Remember the first time, you know, that you tightened my band up. Like, Let's try that again. So I went to, you know, I went to Ibiza and I said, Charles, give me a veggie plate. And you know, Charles loaded me up with all those olive oil, you know, vegetables, you know, that he, that he so loved to do, you know, and uh, got stuck immediately and came back to you like in a panic. Hey, I can't, can't, nothing's going down. You undid it. And then it was like, hey, if you want to do it, you know, let's let's look at that, you know, keep trying to do it. Let's, you know, let's kind of reconvene. I think I took a few months off from even, you know, talking to you, maybe maybe more, almost a year, maybe. And uh, and then I came back to you and said, hey, let's go. Let's roll. Um, you know, that's kind of how it all 
that's kind of how it all started. So then we did your gastric bypass and you did super well after that. Remember that? Yeah. I, I came in and I was like, Hey, how much, how, how much weight did I lose? I mean, I lost like 30 pounds on the pre-op, you know, like it was something crazy. Uh, you know, but, but, you know, the thing about it is, is I would thought that I was trading, you know, this life that I used to have of greatness and coolness. And so I remember, I remember like the two weeks before I had planned the whole week out. I mean, I, I ate at Killens, I had Kobe A5, I had every major meal you could have. I flew, I flew friends in from work, you know, all across the country to have my last meal with me, you know, <laughs> gave instructions to all my buddies. Hey, if I die. Uh, do this for me, do this, do that, you know, all those things. And, you know, came, came into surgery and it was a real solemn. And, you know, the thing about it is, is like up to that point, you know, some of the pictures you see of me with my sons in football uniforms, um, some of those were the last pictures that I had, that I had planned on taking if I had died. You know what I'm saying? Uh, you thought you were going to die from surgery or from just, I, I just, I just didn't know. I was like, you know, I have no idea here. I'm, I'm 500 pounds, you know, going under the knife with, you know, a, with a preceding, you know, operation that was, you know, uh, done by, by one of your friends. Um, and I just didn't know. I was, I had no idea. So, you know, I, I remember my, you know, I, I remember, uh, in the, in the, in the surgery, you know, in the pre-op and, uh, the song sailing was going playing, uh, sailing, you know, Christopher mm -hmm. cross. And, uh, so that's my, one of my, one of my songs, my, my uh, workout songs I listened to, but, um, the, uh, you know, my wife said, hey, we need to get pictures. I was like, no pictures. Wait, stop for a second. You work out to the song Sailing? Oh, yeah, yeah. Sometimes I do. Yeah, really. Dude, we need to go over your yeah. playlist. But anyway. I have a very eclectic workout playlist. Uh, they're, they're all yeah, there. sailing would be uh, you know something I might listen to in a bathtub. But uh... Yeah, but they're, they're, all, they're all memories of, uh, of just yeah. spots that just changed my life, you know. But the... Um, but Mandy took two pictures and that uh, that's one of the pictures that you're, I think you're showing right there of, cause I didn't want any pictures taken of me at all. I was like, I'm an embarrassment. I, I may be super successful in the pipeline world of supplies and making shit happen on a pipeline. But, you know, as far as me, you know, I don't, I don't want any, I don't want a memory of that. You know, just remember me of right. how, remember that I started a company of five grand and grew it to $18 million. That would be yeah. a memory kids that you guys need to have. Not, not that dad couldn't control how much he ate and he's 500 pounds, you know? Right. Um, so, you know, it, but it, so it was a different kind of addiction. I, I, and I didn't even never smell marijuana until, you know, for forever. You know I mean? I mean, the, some of the stuff that people talk about, like going through college and, you know, drinking and I never dealt with that. I dealt with food. You know, but well, tell me this, like after the surgery, after you had the bypass, what did it give you? Like, what, how did it help you? Uh, you know, I, I don't know, you know, whenever you go in surgery and then you don't know, it's going to be a life changing moment. I can't remember everything you told me other than, uh, you know, I, I think, I, I don't know, but you, you, you basically said, Hey, you know, this is going to give you about 75 to hundred pounds head start and you have to lose close to you know 200 you have to almost lose do over double that so you know in two years you could be back where you're at and you're going to be have a year of happiness a year of fun but then it's just going to come back and i and i don't know you know some of those things that happened during that time you know because it's just i mean it's so emotional you know i, I came home from the surgery and I just remember crying on the, on the, on my chair, just crying. I was just boohooing with, I mean, two days after surgery, you know, boohooing out of like loss of your old life or no, just sobbing that it came to this, you know, hmm. here I, right. I'm rock, but it came to this kids. I only did this for y'all. I didn't do it for me. And I'm sorry. Cause I mean, it was so miserable. For so you did the surgery. You felt like a failure and the, the, you know, doing the surgery felt like yeah. a failure. Yeah. Yeah, it's like you couldn't do it on your own, you know, um, that, that kind of thing. So it was kind of like a rock bottom moment for me. But, you know, you told me, hey, and I, and I talk about this in some of the stuff when I'm doing my talks, but you said, hey, you know, in my mind, when I woke up from anesthesia, I wasn't 500 pounds anymore. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I couldn't be. And it was kind of like I went into the witness protection program for fat people, you know, and I and I was I was still fat, but. I wasn't fat. 
And I was I was going to pretend I wasn't fat. And I can remember everything, every shortcut that I knew about, I wouldn't do. I remember bending down and tie, tying my shoe. You know what I'm saying? I remember parking in the back of the parking lot so I could walk all the way to the front of the, you know, to, to the grocery store. I remember, you know, just taking the longest way. I, you know, then you were like, hey, try to get 10,000 steps a day. And, you know, those kind of things just started echoing in me, you know, that, hey, you know what? I got to pretend I'm going to be different. And, you know, I, I think I think at that point, that's kind of where where things just started clicking, you know, and then and then it was kind of like, hey, I've never done what I'm doing. This is kind of fun, you know, and, and you said impossible is a dare. You know, that was one of the things that you said to me that, you know, I kind of built built my whole premise of who, you know, who Marcus became over the last four years or, you know, five years, however long it's been. And, right. um, you know, so it's like, Hey, if you can't think it, you know, if you can think it, you can do it, you know, and just try to do it. Just keep doing it until it happens. If you fail, who cares? You're just going to keep going, you know? So it was kind of like this whole rebirthing of, of, you know, of, uh, a, a new chapter, you know, I, I didn't drink anything but water for, for a year, you know, at all. I can remember, I can remember calling you, maybe, maybe it was like nine, nine or 10 months. Cause I remember calling you like, Hey, you know, can I have a glass of wine? You're like, no, <laughs> I was like, you know, please, you know, then I think I called you, I called you, you know, probably 10 times about that one thing. And you were like, yes, one glass, you know? Uh, and that was like way, way, way into it. I mean, I had done some monumental things, you know, a year from, you know, a year from being 500 pounds, I did an Olympic triathlon with you. And, you know, in, in my, yeah, Marcus and I went to Miami and we did the Olympic try and, that was a that was an exciting time for me to see you do that to to see your excitement about it, Jason. Um, have you heard a little bit about Marcus's story? So you know, all his life overweight, wasn't really into drugs and alcohol. A little bit later, as he started getting very overweight, started drinking. Um, we did the surgery. Now I see this a lot. You know, there were some studies. I think you and I talked about it on your podcast where they did functional MRIs of the brain, and if you look at someone who suffers with obesity, their brain has a dopamine receptor deficit in the arcuate nucleus, very similar to addicts, alcohol addiction, uh, cocaine addicts. How much do you think an addiction, so Marcus was like, I wasn't interested in drugs, I was just interested in food. Is that a true physiologic addiction, do you think? Or is that his upbringing? Is it genetics? Is it all of it? Yeah, I think it's all of it. I don't think our genes sort of solidify us in concrete. Otherwise, there'd be no room for free will. And I believe people can grow and improve. So um, not only do the brains look the same on imaging, but especially alcoholics, uh, the dopamine receptor, there's a dopamine deficiency, sort of like an improper mechanism of using the main neurotransmitter that makes us feel satiated and rewarded and impairs a sort of survival kind of truth so that that midbrain keeps going. The same thing happens in alcoholics with, uh, with sugar. So you, you get the exact same response. And it, I've been practicing addiction medicine almost 18 years. There's always been at least one obesity surgery patient in, inpatient for the whole time. Oh yeah, I bet. <laughs> because, so what happens is, is like, so I, Marcus, I'm curious, how old were you when you had your obesity surgery? Uh, it was uh, four years ago, right? Four years ago, Doc? Five years ago? Somewhere around there. Four or five years ago. So okay. Was, I'm 48. Well, you had a previous surgery a few years before. Uh, yeah, but I didn't really drink. I didn't, there was no drinking. Oh, yeah. So lap band was probably when I was 35. So probably, yeah, so I'm 48. Which surgery did you have four years ago? Uh, that was a gastric bypass. Okay. So that makes sense. I was I didn't want to speak out of turn. What when did you start drinking regularly and or heavily? Uh probably two years after the gastric right. bypass. Yeah. Okay. So so here's what happens, man. Um well, I'm going the wrong way. So alcohol is metabolized in the body at a steady state. Like everybody basically metabolizes alcohol at a certain rate, right? Mm -hmm. That's why if you drink a lot the next day you wake up and you can blow greater than a 0.18 or you know you still register as drunk because no matter what the body just can't break it down any faster 
the the problem with people who have had your type of surgery is that more alcohol gets absorbed more rapidly. Mm -hmm. So you might be drinking like like a, a person who hasn't had that surgery. You both are metabolizing it the same, but you have a lot more in you. Yeah. We also we also know that if you just put a mechanical barrier between you and your drug of choice, addiction is going to come out sideways. So it whether it's whether it's people who have food addiction and they just get the surgery and they really don't know what it, what is addiction and then they turn to alcohol which is by far the most common but also if somebody's an alcoholic and's like okay I'm just not drinking again again I'm just not drinking again but absolutely does nothing to change their lifestyle for from a you know an alcoholic one to a recovery one it can come out sideways with gambling or sex or food or marijuana people love to go on marijuana maintenance programs but it, anything that works in that same part of the brain is just going to get a check by what yeah, you and, prime by eating the way and, you and eat. I, I saw that in marcus so marcus if i could speak for you but i see this a lot in other patients and, and you know in our surgery realm we call it cross addiction so we take away food because you just can't eat that much food you couldn't go to uchi and have a whole big platter so you find other ways to stimulate that dopamine. In the beginning, Marcus went crazy with the exercise. Like he just didn't stop. And it's all, I want everybody to exercise, but Marcus took it to a different level. He was gonna do an Ironman. Then he was gonna do, hey doc, you wanna do five Ironman in five days with me? No, Marcus, I don't wanna do five Ironman in five. Do you wanna bike across America with me? No, Marcus, I don't. So um, he, he did this kind of cross addiction. Then I think, Marcus, you started getting some injuries and that's when drinking has come back on. Tell us what's been going on lately. So no, it was COVID. You know, so so you you know you so I went through. You know, I did uh, Ironman Texas twice. I did uh, the next year. Um, I did. You know, I raised like a hundred thousand dollars for Ironman Foundation. I, I did Kona, and so I did I did Ironman Kona. Uh, you know, during the whole time, I document the whole thing with uh, with uh, the um, film crew. You know, getting ready for a deal. Then I did Ironman Arizona last. You know, two years ago. Uh, you know, uh, 2000, what was it? 2019, we did uh, two, uh, Ironman Arizona. And then 2020 came and, you know, we were going to do Texas again. Just going to be full on. I was, I was in full ramp mode. I mean, uh, when COVID happened, you know, I was riding, you know, 60, 70 miles on the weekend and uh, I was running, you know, a half marathon, you know, on training with, um, you know, with no stops. So, you know, I was, I was pretty much on track. And uh, the COVID happened, dropped everything. So then I just started focusing on work. Um, our CEO got fired. New CEO came in. Um, you know, I had to go to I had to go to work. So I kind of kind of just took all of that, you know, extra that Marcus is, you know, uh, and I'm I'm extra. You know, what I'm saying, um, and just totally focused on my whole marketing. Um, you know that I you know that's what I am. I'm a marketer type type guy and big, big, I, I like big things. I like, you know, I like doing things big and, um, jumped into reinventing how, you know, how you weld pipe on a pipeline, uh, and totally, you know, 10 months ago, and it, it's not a big deal. I mean, you guys probably won't even understand what I'm saying, but 10 months ago, that was on a napkin and, you know, I've, I've, I've welded six miles of pipe on a job in Beaumont. And so, but during that time, now I'm, now I'm kind of back in the mothership of where I've, cut my teeth of, you know, making my money and that kind of thing. And I'm hanging around, you know, this group of guys that's, you know, pipeliners. And, you know, um, I basically jump in that deal and I'm on the pipeline, you know, I'm, I'm in the oil field industry and, and, you know, every night you're drinking and every night you're, you're, you're doing, you know, you're just, you know, you're, you're in it, you're in it to win it. And so, you know, just started feeling like we're, you know, what you take one, you know, just drink one glass of wine and you are, you're instantly feeling that buzz and you're like, oh, this is gonna be good. So COVID happened, it was gonna be locked down. I, you know, I got four kids, I got three of them at home and I went and bought a case of wine. I was like, hey, this is gonna be fun. You know, let's just, so I just, you know, started drink, you know, drinking a bottle of wine almost every night and going, this, I feel like crap in the morning. So I should be on the bike, you know, I should be doing this stuff, but COVID's gonna be in anytime never ended, you know, just hasn't ended, you know, so just found myself where, you know, now, now you're like, Hey, I'm tired of drinking wine. I'm gonna try, try some vodka, you know, sure. and then you're hit. I mean, you know, you're, you're just taking a hit. I mean, it's, it's, you're just feeling it. And, you know, I told doc, I was like, Hey, I'm quitting, you know, I'm quitting. This is happening. You know, I've, I've done it. You know, I've 
I've done some crazy shit and I could do that again. And uh, so, you know, I just knew that January one was going to be my last day of drinking. And, uh, you know, it, it, it's not like I had to have a drink, but it was like, I could tell, you know, cause knowing, you know, knowing about, um, you know, not, not, not being the expert, not being a doctor on, you know, that looks at brain shit like you guys, but just knowing, <laughs> just knowing, knowing what I, what I knew, I knew that, Hey, you know, the moment you really start thinking about alcohol before it's even time to even you're, there's not even there, you, you may have a little bit of a problem going. And I can remember with food, you know, that same thought, you know, like, Hey, what am I going to eat tonight? You know, and I wasn't even hungry. It was just like, Hey, what, you know, well, let's go eat something fancy or let's go do this. Let's eat something rich. And so, you know, it's just I, noon would kick and I'd be on the pipeline or I'd be at the shop and I'd be like, hmm, uh, what kind of wine do I have at the house? And start kind of planning that out. I'm like, this is not right. You know, so, you know, just a couple of, you know, just being, being who I am, I just said, Hey, you know what? Well, see, it's the being who you am. This is what I want to ask Jason, because this is an interesting, you know, do you remember that movie Awakenings um, yeah. where Robert De Niro is the Parkinson? They come up with the, the, the medication. Was it Robert De Niro? I can't remember. You're right. Yeah. yeah. So, so he had the Parkinson's. They came up with the, Robert Williams, right. and Robin's right. And they, um, you know, the Parkinson's, the Parkinson's got better, but then they went back to Parkinson's. It was very depressing. I feel that way with obesity. Like I get someone thin and they're doing great. A couple years later, they come back to see me and they're starting to gain weight again. They're starting to have some of the same problems I had again. In addiction, I'm sure you see this. And this is, I've heard discussed in the addiction world a bit. Once an addict, always an addict? Yes, th there are changes that, that are sort of permanent. Like once they're there, they're always there. Like I've been sober almost 18 years or 17 so years. There's no cure. Do you still consider yourself an alcoholic? Or absolutely. An addict? Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Um, it's dormant and it doesn't take much to turn the fire on. So like what Marcus was saying was very interesting, right? Like that first drink that made you feel like you want a lot. The thing with alcoholics, addicts is that one is too much because a thousand is never enough. Now, Garth, when you or somebody like my wife, when they have a glass of wine, they feel satiated, right? You might enjoy it with, with dinner and it pairs well. When Marcus and I drink, it's not like a satiation. It's actual fight or flight. And, and this wiring, interestingly enough, we can see in very strong family histories or once alcoholism has already been activated. And once it's activated, I mean, yeah, you could be in, you could be in recovery but there's no reversion. That is, you know, there, there's certain types of alcoholics and I'm pretty sure Marcus, you're like me. It's like, yeah, you can't ever manage your drinking. Now, there are some people that develop alcoholism that looks like they can, they can manage with some medicine help, you know, with taking a naltrexone, but um, it's certainly not the majority of people. And I don't want to give the idea that, yeah, all you need is a is a medicine and then you can drink like a regular person because it's not that easy. Okay, so let's go back to Marcus here. So Marcus um, and, and you, uh, I, I think Jason, you could kind of tell what Marcus is. Tough guy, leader, you know, father figure. I'm gonna do an Iron Man. I'm gonna tough it out. So now he gained some weight back, was drinking. And January 1st, he's like, that's it. I'm gonna white knuckle it out of here. Good or bad reaction. So yeah, man, anybody can like pause, anybody can hold their breath in the dark and I, and, and hopefully you'll make it right. Hopefully you will. But most of us can't do it that way with just, that's called um, a dry drunk. And it's at some point the, you know, restlessness, irritability, discontentment generally come back in. And like when you had the obesity surgery and you jumped the second time and you jumped into exercise, I'd say, yeah, you probably overdid it because you're a deep end kind of guy like me, like Eric Clapton, like like other people, like it's go big or go home. There's no point dipping your toe in the shallow end. But with that said, like, it's great to find a substitute. You need to find a healthy substitute. So exercise is a great fill in as long as it's done with moderation. People like Marcus and I can no more be a, you know, a modicum of moderation than a fish can ride a bicycle, but we can try. And it's all about diverse, you know, diversifying your portfolio. So exercise is going to be one substitute, but so will whatever, you know, you've got to fill in the blank. 
you know, well, tell us the positive mental, tell us the, the positive mental attitude approach to it. Like, how, yeah. right. So we're, I, I don't, I don't teach positive mental attitude. That's like self-help ringing, but I do teach techniques like having a growth mindset or learning um, optimistic explanatory style and things that are evidence-based that are ways to turn, uh, you know, somebody who might be at, at the moment feeling helpless and prone to a relapse into feeling hopeful and staying in recovery. And, you know, the nuts and bolts are probably for a different time, but um, yeah, so there's, that's just sort of what I do and it takes a while and it takes a while to unfold and you give people tools, you let them go out in the world, practice a little bit, they stumble and they come back and um, yeah, it, it's a process, man. It's like managing diabetes. You never, you never get it licked with one doctor visit, right? It does take course corrections and, um, you know, recovery is definitely possible. And Marcus, I wish you all, all the hope and the, I mean, all the luck in the world and you could be successful. You know, you're a guy with a ton of willpower. And that's, that's the strange thing is that like, you look at somebody like Marcus, who's done all these Ironmans or triathlons, whatever that five in a row that takes willpower. It takes craziness, but it takes a lot of willpower. And for I, you to like, yeah, that we never really did that plan. That was just a, <laughs> <laughs> but you've done enough, but, but yeah, it does take craziness. And, um, so Marcus, what do you think about that? Are you like, uh, how are you in the, so what's it been? It's been a week or two, no drinks. Yeah, no, no, it's been 10 days and, uh, plant-based the whole time. Uh, you know, it's, it, it, you know, alcohol, you know, I could tell, and, and I'm not saying, you know, yeah, I, there was a problem approaching. Uh, maybe you can tell me this, but you know, I, like I said, I never, never drank until I was 24, you know, really just started heavy drinking probably over the last four, four to five months. Right. So it hasn't been like, there's not, yeah, this. but it's somewhat of a cross addiction, right? Because so don't think about it being the alcohol or, you know, at one point it was the food, the next point it was the exercise. Now it's the alcohol. Yeah. So it's not that it's not the alcohol necessarily that we're focusing on. It's the addiction mindset. Yeah. Jason, would you agree? Addiction mindset. I, I think it's the addictive behaviors, right? Addiction okay. is a lot of things, but a, a habit, it's certainly a bad habit. Yeah. You know? Oh, definitely. Yeah. So it, Gar's absolutely right. It doesn't matter what the substance or process is. If yeah. addiction is active, you know, over here it's food and then whoop, wrong way. So like food, exercise, alcohol, like it just doesn't matter what it is. If it's active, man, it's active. And yeah. Gar's, Gar's right on that. I mean, people didn't see you and maybe you could talk about your lowest, but I saw you at your lowest and it was scary. And um, I don't, you know, funny enough, I don't, I don't think I ever thought you would get out of it. Like I was like, oh, this is gonna be a lifelong problem. What did you do? Uh, what did you do to get out of it? But more importantly, why have you never had a single lapse ever since? Are you doing daily self care now, or what's your regimen to keep yourself? What What could Marcus look to in in kind of a uh, an example of what you do not to not to go back? Yeah. So Marcus, that 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 like bottom that you felt when you had to have the surgery, um, just that despair. That's where I was. And it was so bad, like, yeah, Garth, I mean, you, you saw me at my absolute worst. And, and that was me not being able to just stop and stay stopped. I tried to, at that point, I was taking so many uh, opiates and benzos that to stop was dangerous. I could have died. My body just wouldn't like let me do it. So I was just always sedated and, and it was ugly. And, and it was it was so bad, Garth, that, I don't have to do, I don't have to like get on my knees on a daily basis. For me, the thought of like taking a pill or drinking is the same thing in my head as I might as well stick my face in a engine, you know, in a plane engine as it's going off a cliff because there's nothing good waiting. Like there would be no benefit. There's no upside. I suck at drinking. I suck at taking, you know, doing recreational things. So I just don't do it. So it's a line in the sand type thing. Yeah, it painfully, painfully uh, won that that awareness. Very painfully won. You know, the other question I have for you, because I see people, we talk a lot about goals and goal setting. This is getting a little bit away from addiction. We all have our little, at least minor addictions, you know. Um, well, not addictions. I, you know, even though you do a habit, it's not habit. Addiction is addiction is not an adjective. Right. 
I got you. It's a disease. Um, okay, let, let, me, let, let me take it this way though. I, I talk to patients and I struggle with the best advice on, on this kind of a ground. So there is the idea that for some patients I feel a line in the sand is necessary. Like, have you ever heard the saying, doing something 99% is tough, but doing it 100% is easy? Um, because if they're just never, you've never heard that before. Oh, I get it. Yeah. I under, totally yeah. get that. Because like, if I tell someone, I want you to eat healthy 99% of the time, then they have like, you know, some chips and then they're like, that was my 1%, but well, maybe it was, I'll, I'll have chips again this afternoon and then I'm going to go, you know, but if there's a line in the sand that says no chips, yeah. no chips, yeah, nice. is, is that better? Or then some people are like, well, if it's extreme, I can't do it or I won't stick with it. So I need a little chips yeah. here and there, that kind of thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So it just depends on the individual. It depends on the individual. So yeah, if I, if I have chips, I'm going to have those negotiations in my head where, well, that really wasn't 1%. It was like 0.8%. So I could stretch it out a little bit. And then, you know, like, <laughs> what was that thing body for life where there was like a cheat yeah. day? So there was yes, a cheat yeah. day, right? And right. I would wake up in the morning on my cheat day and I would eat nonstop shit and Garth, like halfway through me yes. telling you all that I was eating, you're like, I really don't think that was the, uh, the ethos of the cheat day. I think it's like to have a meal, <laughs> like maybe right. at a Mexican restaurant, Jason. I'm like, Oh really? It's not to like go buy everything I've ever wanted in my life and eat it at one time. Um, and then because I hate myself, like eat it again. Uh, yeah. So some people, people say, Oh, you have so much willpower because I don't drink. No, as long as I don't drink, I'm okay. But once I have one, that turns on that craving for an unlimited amount. So yeah, that that line well, in the sand is survival. So so Marcus, do you do you feel like what's your plan of attack here? Are you going to go with the ninety nine percent? Are you going to go with the hundred percent? No, you know I, it's it's a day by day deal. You know, I, you know I think uh, with me, you know I can remember back even before the weight loss surgery. You know I got I got I got hooked on Ativan, right? I was having anxiety like it. 22, 23 years old, uh, you know, thought I was going to have a heart attack because I was so big, right? And it was like, I'm going to die of a heart attack. So went to the doctor, heart doctor, they did a heart cath, you know, I talked him into that. And finally, like, no, there's your, your heart's perfect. Uh, what are you doing? You're, you're just, you're crazy. So we're going to give you Ativan and just take one of these when you feel that way. So I remember, like, I remember doing Ativan for, you know, like starting off with like one at night and then it would be like, you know, I can remember like three years into, two years into it, which should never take out of it that long. I don't think ever, but you know, they didn't tell me how addictive it was, but you know, I was taking four or five a day, you know? And, you know, I was like, Hey, I'm quitting. You know, and I told a doctor friend of mine, I'm just quitting. He's like, dude, you can't quit that shit that way. You got to wean yourself off and it's super hard. You need to probably check in somewhere and go get help. And I was like, no, I'm going to do it. You know? So I kind of started weaning back. You know, so this this whole thing of you know everything this doc this doc saying my dog is barking in the background, but um, you know the the everything he's saying is relatable. You know, so you can just see the the traits of where I've been. You know, I always go. You know, there's always levels of of um, different things that I've attached myself to. You know, uh, one thing that I love, one of the attachments that I love is I love helping people. Right, I, I you know I put myself out there. You know, um, with the following that I've got with, uh, you know, the story that I have, uh, you know, there, you know, the, all the footage that I've, I've accumulated, you know, climbing the mountains and, you know, doing the things that I love, you know, to do, uh, you know, um, all kind of just culminate around just trying to help people through the day to day, you know, so, you know, it was real, real vulnerable, uh, probably, you know, two weeks ago when I started talking about, Hey, I'm, 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 I'm not drinking. I can't remember a day in the last four months that I haven't drank except for one or two maybe. And, you know, um, the, you know, so looking at that going, Hey, you know, vulner vulnerability is like, Hey, Marcus is a, is a superhero and he's done all these Ironmans. He's a badass, And, you know, Hey, let's be like Marcus and let's, you can do anything you set your mind to. I mean, the Ironman world, you know, that's kind of what I set myself up to be. I thought, you know, you gotta be careful that Marcus, I see this a lot, right? Where, um, you become a hero to others when you haven't completely healed yourself, if even you're ever completely healed. And then you have this added burden of wanting to 
help others and be an example to them, but yet struggling with your own problems. And you also got to remember, and I think Jason kind of hit on this and maybe can again, but you do what you always done, you're going to get what you always got. So I would just caution you not to be like bullheaded, like I'm going to beat this because I'm Marcus Cook and I could beat anything. And maybe look at something else and realize, look, I got a problem and I may need some help in fighting and I might not accept your vulnerability to, to look for help. Yeah, that's where I was going with it. Yeah, so yeah, being vulnerable is like, hey, let's get on a podcast with you know with Doc and talk about you know drift. <laughs> that is vulnerable. Was someone that I've that ever is- met in my life, you know. So you know, uh, I'm all for it. You know, it's a it's a it's a deal of like, hey, I came to you to get help one time, and uh, it, it led me to some badass stuff, you know. So yeah, I, I don't I believe that you meet people in your life and the the puzzle pieces work themselves out of like why you met that person you know what i'm saying like like tonight yeah. it was it was to meet your buddy here you know uh yeah. and and, pro- and probably have a relationship with them you know saying hey okay so how how do we really beat this thing to where this doesn't creep up in another area and you know how can i help my kids if this is a you know my dad was an alcoholic you know so i'm all the things that kind of start ringing a bell like hey you know what this is and you know the thing about it is is that once you once you put yourself out there you, you know, I've gotten more PM, you know, DMs and, you know, messaging from people that are, you know, all in the space that I'm in of like, Hey, I I've been drinking this whole year. I got to stop too. You know, Uh, it's a a real issue. Yeah. When I want, when I want patients to find a role model, I don't want them to find the ripped six pack abs. Oh, look for six months. I did something and look how I want them to find you, Marcus. I want them to find someone who's been in the trenches, knows that you could make these huge changes, but knows that, you know, the future is tough. And I always tell people this is not just weight loss, but life is a, you know, a journey and not a destination. You're not going to get there one day and be like, oh, here I am, an Iron Man. Everything's good for the rest of my life. It just doesn't work that way. Yeah, it's no, it's, it's a real deal. Uh, you know, it's a, it's a real deal. Go ahead, Doc. Hey, um, you guys are both, I think, really experts on this topic. And so I want to kind of open it up. Jeff, we got a lot of people asking questions. So this is a question about 12-step. Are you a 12-step member? What do you think of the 12-step program? Jace, what do you think of that? Yeah, so uh, when I got sober, I I went to a gazillion 12-step meetings. And, you know, 12 steps sort of stays anonymous at, at radio, television, film. So I'm definitely not speaking as a member. I could tell you personally, um, there's evidence that it works, but it, abs- it doesn't work for everybody. It does not work for everybody. In fact, most people don't get sober through a 12 step route. So that's why like when I treat people now as a little more wise, I don't just try to force one option on them, but I try to tease out like where are their values, what's going to work for them. And, and there's, you know, definitely options. So I think it works for some people, um, but I definitely think that, you know, in order to be effective, my range has to be a lot broader. Right. And we do the same with surgery or weight loss in general. You know, I could do a band, I could do a bypass, I could do a sleeve, we could do medical weight loss. Everybody's different and everybody's going to have their, their kind of things. What other questions we got out there? Oh, does every weight loss surgery patient have transfer addiction? The numbers right now, basically in the research is nine to 10% of people will have a cross addiction. I think it's higher than that because sometimes we don't think of things as an addiction. Like we don't think that your, you know, huge shopping bill is an addiction, but it really can be. You may be getting these same dopamine responses from, you know, signing up on Amazon. Um, And so it really is, it's a real problem with weight loss. And I do see with patients that they used to medicate with food. And now I take away that ability to medicate with food and that's where the dopamine needs to be activated somehow. And it can be sex, it could be, oh, we've seen some people with some really bad uh, problems with, um, with sexual addiction, with shopping, with gambling. Uh, I had a, one patient had a terrible problem with gambling afterwards and never had any gambling issues before. So it really can transfer. Marcus, you had, you uh, had talked about um, your father having addiction. I, Jason, I take it you see a lot of that running in families. Did, did your father do anything to kick it? How did it go with him? He, he does everything in moderation. Now he, uh, you yeah, know, he's 77, uh, lives, lives out in Canyon Lake. And, 
I think he's a recreational kind of guy. He's a little bit of a hippie. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, I mean, he's nothing's really crazy out of control with him right now. But, yeah, I remember as a kid, you know, uh, he definitely had problems, uh, you know, going through some of the stuff, you know, some of the drinking, you know, issues. Uh, and then he became a preacher, you know, that kind of thing. Um, anyway, that's kind of dad. But it definitely knew that was in the family history of, of uh, there was, you know, some, some stuff that I was dealing with. Which brings up the issue, Jason. What do you tell like people like Marcus who has a family? What do you tell what do you tell them to do with the kids? Like how do you prevent the kids from going down this pathway? A great question. So Marcus, yeah, your dad have it had it and you had a 60% chance of having it. Um, the earlier somebody drinks in life, the quicker it can activate. So we try to get them to wait as long as possible. Uh, there we don't know exactly what preventive measure works. Don't say no doesn't work. Dare increases use. And Garth, like you were saying, if I were to march somebody like Robert Downey Jr. in front of a bunch of like teenagers and say, and let him tell his story of, hey man, I, I partied my butt off. I did drugs, sex, drugs, rock and roll, got absolution. And now I'm, I got an Oscar and I'm in every Marvel movie. Then um, the kids want the projection of their life to mimic that exactly. So having somebody like Marcus who, yeah, you know, I made it this far, I had a few steps back and I'm still trying, like I'm imperfect, but this is how, this is how you succeed because, you know, nothing works hundred percent all the time. Right. Um, what, since we don't know exactly what's a foolproof way, because I'm, I'm sure there isn't one is the best thing to do is talk to them, be completely transparent, right? Like my kids know my story and there is a, um, pediatric addiction researcher who did this really cool thing with her kids. I don't know how old your kids are, Marcus, but I'm doing it with mine and it sounds good. I'm not sure there's a whole lot of evidence yet, but I told them it, if you can wait until you're 17 to try alcohol, I'll give you a thousand dollars. My oldest one made it so far. My other one's 15. And I was like, and if you do any drugs, other drugs, because alcohol is definitely a drug. If you do any other drugs before you're 25, I'll kill you. But if you can wait until after you're 25, when the brain fully you know, develops and the chance of developing addiction goes down tremendously, it's like, uh, you know, I'll give you 2000 or 3000. I don't remember what it was. And, you know, it's, it's pretty strong in my family. Sounds like yours too. Um, I lost a brother due to complications of his food addiction that Ye my brother Yale would starve himself. He was obese. And, you know, my mom wrote his ass, wrote his ass. And, and he would actually not eat for long periods of time. And what starvation does is it causes the heart to enlarge. And he had that. And it like he started passing out when he was in college. And then after he graduated law school, he passed away. But it was from food addiction and mm -hmm. his solution to it during his formative years. And uh, yeah, you know, my kids know my story. They know the dangers of it. That doesn't mean that they're out of it. And, you know, I don't, I'm not anti-alcohol. Like my wife drinks, I benefit, you know, but she's weird in my opinion, because she can have half a glass and like put it down. I think she's crazy because it's like, if I was an alcoholic, I drink all the time. Like she's nuts. Yeah. My kids are 26, uh, not, really no, 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 showing no signs of, of any, you know, any kind of issues with it. 26, 21, 18 and, uh, 14. And, you know, they, they all didn't drink till they're 21. Uh, how's so their weight? How's yeah, they're, like, they're you know that Zach, my son Zachary, he's done a he's done a uh, you know thirty k uh, running event, um, then he did a or fifty k running event, and then he's done a half Ironman. So, you know his they. they but you got to see their pictures, Jason, because the whole family lost weight with 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 Marcus. The, the whole family really lost a lot of weight with him. Yeah, we, we, of, and we, you know we we all you know we we all you know think about it is is the journey that I'm on, you know, um, uh, you know, so again, you know, right. My, my, the weight that I am with my skin and all that, I, you know, I'm roughly, I think, I think the lowest I ever got with everything was like, what was it doc? Like two thirty five. Then yeah. I got the stomach off, you know, I got my stomach taken off and I was like at two ten, but it was really kind of an unhealthy two ten because I had an internal hernia, got that fixed. And then, um, and then I, so really where it was at two forty five is kind of like, where I just sat. Uh, and that's kind of where I did all my Ironmans at, you know, um, and then over COVID, you know, I, I got to be like three, uh, my heaviest was like 308. 
and now I'm down back to 300 over the last week and a half. Um, and it's kind of like, a, you know, whenever I started going through how, you know, how I did it, you know, there was, there was like, you know, I, I had to realize there was a change that needed to happen. And then I set a goal of what I wanted to do. And then I did the, got a team around me of accountability. And then I did the work and then I reached the goal and then I moved the goal. Well, I, I did that all the way from, you know, I was 500 pounds all the way down to, you know, whatever. And I did that from, you know, the first, you know, 5k turkey trot I did, you know, to where, you know, I, you know, I, you know, I ran a, you know, ran half marathons and then, you know, I mean, I just ramped every, you know, every, every distance of anything I did. So it's kind of like whenever I rein back in, of like, Hey, you know, and I want y'all to know, it's not like a white knuckle. I'm going to do this. It's more of a, you've done some impossible shit. So use the same thing that got you there. And the thing, you know, so I just kind of did those five steps and it's, you know, it's simple, you know, Hey, I, I have a problem. I know I got to, I got to change. I'm going to, my goal is what I'm not going to, I'm, I'm not drinking for 30 days. Now in my mind, every time I hit one of those goals, like that, that picture where me and Garth are coming across at Olympic and I'm holding my hand up, I wasn't really happy at that moment, you know, I, because I was thinking about what am I doing next? Like, what is the next thing I could do? Because I have to have, I have to have something to, to, to do, you know, and I want to do something. And, you know, the, the accountability of, you know, putting it up is like, Hey, that's my, you know, when you have 37,000 people following you, a lot of them are going to be haters. And a lot of them are going to be people that love you, you know, and a lot of people are going through the same shit I'm going through, you know? And Hey, uh, Marcus, can I ask you a quick question? Yeah. So this, this goal setting and accountability and sort of evaluating, could you have applied that when you were 500 pounds to start yeah. the weight loss then? Yeah. You know, it, after learning that kind of thought process of how you dig out of a hole and how you, you know, I, I, I even apply that to where I'm at with work. You know I mean? Here I did a, you know, here I have this invention that, that is, uh, you know, uh, it's a hard thing to do. And you know what I do, I got a goal. I got people around me that I know can achieve the goal. And then we, we do the work, you know, so it's kind of like, I think so. Yeah. But do you think you would have been successful getting down? Where were you going with this, Jason? So, yeah. So you had, you had built an $18 million company from $5,000 before your surgery. So it's not like you're somebody who hadn't learned that they could be successful doing things. So I guess where I'm going with this is that like, I think the, the obesity surgery, you woke up with the mindset that you're skinny yeah. and you started behaving that way. And then, but like there are a lot of people that couldn't, no matter what they do, that they need that head start, right? They need that surgery uh -huh. and then they can do it. But most of the time, like Garth, correct me if I'm wrong, but like they start putting on the weight, they don't have to wait until they're absolutely needing a whole nother surgery. Like you can intervene at any point. And there's people sure. that like, at, so the thing is, is like when you start gaining the weight and you're drinking, Marcus, it's so easy to be like, well, I'm screwed. Oh, I feel yeah. bad about myself. And I'm going to drown how I feel. So even though you put so, weight yeah, Marcus, on Right. So Marcus is doing the right thing, right? Marcus noticed. He called me up. He was like, oh, shit. I've made a mistake, but I know how to get back. I know what I did, and I know how to get back. And that's the beauty of Marcus. A lot of people are doing exactly what you say, Jason, is where they're like, oh, my God. I gained back some weight. That's it. I'm done. This is all a failure. And they felt self-sabotaging. We do. I think the goal setting is it's such a anchor for people and it is so important. I use it all the time now myself. And we always teach people what we call smart goals. So you have to set very specific goals. So you heard Marcus talking about how he had a goal. Like I remember when you were going through this, Marcus, you said, we're gonna do, I'm gonna do a sprint try and then you and I are gonna do an Olympic try and then I'm gonna do uh, a Ironman. So instead of being like, oh, I'm gonna do an Ironman and that's all I'm gonna think about, you had these little specific goals that were measurable, that were attainable because an Ironman wasn't yet attainable, then you worked yourself up to your goals. And that's crucial for people. I think the other thing that Marcus did that I wish all my patients would do is I don't, I don't feel like Marcus was that focused on the weight. He was focused on the goals. He was like, these are my goals. And you never talked to me about a goal weight. You were always talking to me about my goal is to do an Ironman. My goal is to uh, teach people to exercise. And that's really important too. It's important when you said, like my goal is not to make someone weigh less. Um, if you're going to run a marathon, if you're going to be in a triathlon, I don't want your goal to be you're going to run a marathon. I want your goal to be you're going to become a runner. 
or your goal to be, I'm going to change my life such that the conception I have, because I don't think, Marcus, you ever thought of yourself as an Iron Man. Now, that is an essential part of who you are. And so you've got that kind of um, sense of being that anchor to go back to to set goals with. And I think that's really important when you're goal setting in the future. Yeah, yeah. I mean, you know, the, you know I, I can remember, you know, and I think, um, you know, for both y'all, you know, whenever, when I was 500 pounds, uh, you know, and I did my first Ironman, I, I went to, went to Boulder and we climbed uh, two, we, we climbed two 14,000 footers in a day. Right. Uh, and they were easy climbs, but it was like, you know, I'm sitting on top of this mountain, you know, drinking a cup of coffee and just blown away that here I am. And I just climbed a mountain, which I had, you know, whenever I was 500 pounds, I'd go rent Jeeps and I'd climb, you know, I'd go in the mountains and we'd try to go up, try to do as many Jeep passes as we could because I couldn't get out of the car, but I just love that view, you know? And so here I am, I've climbed these mountains. And then, you know, I can remember that was when, you know, Hurricane Ike or whatever it was here in Houston, I can't remember which one it was, but it was the, no, it was the tropical storm. And, you know, a week later I come back to Houston and I'm, I'm in a canoe you know, and we saved like a hundred people, you know, in my, in the neighborhood right next to me. And so, you know, in my mind, that was another thing that just snapped of like, I didn't know that me having goals to be and come an Ironman would help me pull, you know, this family out of their house. that has got waist high water, put them in a canoe and get them out of here, you know, and had I not done the steps that I've done, you know, could that have happened, you know? And so, you, you know, it's back to that puzzle piece of like, you know, the vulnerability and I'm not trying to be the superhero to anyone. I'm just trying to be the voice of, I am a human and you're a human. And if you're listening and you're having a problem, just know that you don't have to have that problem because it, you're going to have problems. We're all going to have kid issues. We're all going to have spouse issues. We're all going to have you know, money issues. We're all going to have things that happen that you have to make decisions on to make you be a better person. But the more you're thinking that it's not the end, it's just, it's just a stepping stone to where you're going, the more you can come out of it. Right. And that's, and I think that's the biggest part of me. And the reason why I was kind of going back to that earlier of the vulnerability and the accountability. Right. So, so, so here I am 500 pounds, couldn't do anything, did all this stuff got 37,000 people on, on Instagram and now Marcus is drinking too much, but you know what Marcus is letting you know that, Hey, now I relate to whoever's watching that they may have a problem drinking, you know, uh, that, Hey, we, we, we could, we could get out of this. And the way I got out of everything that I've got out of, of everything in the past four or five years is I've realized there was a problem. I got a goal to come out of that problem. I got a yeah. team of people around me that says, "Hey, you know what, Marcus? We ain't letting you do this shit. Stop drinking." And then, then I'm do, doing the work, and the work is, you know what? Instead of, you know, drinking, I'm gonna go get on my bike, or instead of drinking, I'm gonna read a book. Instead of doing doing all these things that are occupying that time, because you know, when I was getting off that ad event, I had to think differently, and I, I remember that I had to, you know, and it's not, you know, and back it's five months of drinking. It's not like I've been drinking for four years, but it was, a, it was, a, you know, that feeling was starting to hit me and I didn't like that feeling because it was a, right. that loss of control. Well, no, it's, it's just the same feeling of like, Hey, this feels too good and it's too easy. And this yeah. is nice. You know, this is a, a relief from relief from the pressure of the COVID world that we live yeah. in. Well, the COVID world has thrown us for a loop. Um, I think we have a couple more questions. I don't want to hold you guys too long. It's been an excellent talk. You guys have really hit all the topics I wanted to hit. Um, can I stop my food addiction, especially at night before bed? Or how do you stop it? Yeah, I mean, look, so, and Jason, we, we talked about, so with, with food, it's a little bit complex. Um, because there is a physiologic component to it. Like you could stop drinking, right? You could just say, I'm not gonna drink anymore. But with food, you gotta eat. Uh, there's also a physiologic, so we talked about dopamine driving you to want um, alcohol, but there's a very primitive part of your brain and your brain stem that drives eating. And it, we are designed to eat, our, our bodies didn't, you know, evolution didn't care if we were fat. It just cared that we got enough food in order to procreate. 
uh, and live through a cold winter. And so we still have this hardware and that hardware secretes ghrelin that makes you hungry. Your fat cells secrete leptin. If you start losing weight, the leptin drops and, uh, and your brain's like, oh my God, I'm in a starvation mode. So it, it is difficult. What I tell people in that situation is first of all, like Marcus was saying, and like Marcus did, you got to become a different person. So a lot of people feel trapped by these, um, hey, I guess, Jason, you don't want me to call it an addiction. Yeah, I'll call it habits. I don't want to call it an addiction, but trapped by these habits. Because you think of yourself as, like, for instance, I'm not a person who likes plants or I'm not a person who exercises. And so you've built this wall around yourself where really the biggest habit you got to quit is that habit of being you and realize there's another person out there. One of the beauties I get in my job is I get to see people like Marcus completely reinvent themselves. So you gotta get a new identity of someone who can do these things, who has done these things, so you have that to rely on. Then you've gotta set very specific goals, like very specific. I, I like the 100% like we were talking about before. Line in the sand, I'm not eating past seven o'clock. I'm just not doing it. I am not gonna eat past seven. I'm gonna eat up to certain times at regular intervals. I'm not eating past seven o'clock. I will drink tea. I will have, um, um, there's a great book called Beck's Diet Solution. Judith Beck is one of the, do you know Judith Beck, um, Jason? Yeah, she's a cognitive behavioral therapist, yeah. And so she, she talks about having if-then situations. So if it's 7.30 and I'm hungry, then I'm gonna do this. Go for a walk, read a book. I, I tell people, you could eat a pickle at zero calories and usually that does it, or an apple. You could say, okay, if I'm really dying, I could do these, you could drink tea. But you come up with an if-then scenario so that you always feel in control. What you don't wanna feel is out of control. Uh, when you feel out of control, that's when you really start getting back into those bad habits. But I see people kick these habits all the time. I see people like, you know, like Marcus who's going to kick it again. And I see people like Marcus, you know, who become Iron Man and become people they never thought they could be before. Anything you guys would add to that? I would, I would say just one thing. What you said was perfect. So I, I, would, I would mirror that. And once you do something for 90 days, it's a lot easier to do on the 91st day. So good habits are really hard to start. So yeah, the idea of, you know, not eating at, at night during the witching hour, we called it. That's, a, that's when most people do their drinking and binge eating. There's that, you know, binge eating disorder. A lot of times it's right before people go to bed or it's at night when you're sort of the craziness of life, the distractions are gone and you're there with yourself. But if you, if you like what Garth said, absolutely, man, whether you think you can or you can't, you're right. And exactly. be that type of person. But just set yourself those little specific goals. But also remember like, okay, I'm gonna evaluate on day 91 and I'm gonna really see if it's easier because once you start to get in the habit, man, now you're doing it and it's a lot, it's easier momentum, but it sure is hard to start. So my heart's yeah. out to you, but just, you could do it. Like, why not you, right? You have all the same machinery we have. Exactly. Um, we have some more questions here. Marcus could read it there. Oh, only, only when I'm with Dr. Garth and, and he talking to him. <laughs> <laughs> so no, <laughs> no, yeah, no, he, he's there. Yeah. No. And so Jason, when you do, so when you, when you do therapy with people, do you, uh, is it intensive? You're not doing psychoanalysis. Is it? No, no you not have young yeah, yeah, it's so, not young. Yeah. So most of what I do is inpatient, but I do have, I do have clients that I work with and, and kind of get them through the program. Like uh, they don't pay doctors through insurance to do what I do, like the positive psychology stuff, you know, unless I'm writing a script or seeing somebody in 10 minutes, there's like no reimbursement. So, so I do have private clients and I do do this. Um, you know, I, I work with a lot of athletes also because of the substance abuse, but, but not only that, but because you know their friends tell them, and a lot of what you're talking about, a lot of mindset things th applies to you know if you make a mistake on the court or once your career is over, uh, the things that we tell ourselves is really the most powerful determinant of what brings happiness at the end of the day. So yeah, I mean I don't I don't sit down and look for Jungian shadows and you know do Freud stuff, but I do do. Like, I, I believe that the past a lot of times has to be uncovered and all that, but the past is best as a guidepost rather than a hitching post. And I like to give people tools now and working for the future. 
That's fantastic. Hey, Jason, what are your books so people can look out for your books if they're interested? Tell us what your two books are and what do they offer to people? Who, who should buy them? So When the Servant Becomes the Master is the first one. Uh, it's second edition came out like last year or the year before. I don't know. You know, the weird thing about COVID is like my temporal knowledge is yeah, just skewed. Like you could tell me it's any day of the week, any day, and yeah. I believe you. So um, yeah, so <laughs> sure. When the Servant Becomes the Master uh, is a kind of explains what is addiction. And it talks about food addiction, but it's really kind of like a good reference book and it's written for everyday people. And then there's the Positive Recovery Daily Guide. And if you want something that will boost where you find human happiness, so something to boost either positivity, engagement, relationship, meaning, or achievement on a daily basis, you start on day one when you pick it up and it's really best done with a partner, but it's hard to do because I had to make it that way so that it's gonna be worthwhile to repeat it year after year. So it's called Positive Recovery Daily Guide, When the Servant Becomes a Master. And those are both available on Amazon. And Marcus, people could find you on uh, Big to Little. Big to Little, that's it. Big to Little. Um, at Big to Little on Instagram and Big to Little on Facebook too, right? That's right. All right. Put well, links in the description. And we'll put, we'll put links in our description um, that will be on my website and on the different social medias. Uh, I thank you guys a lot. That was really an awesome conversation. Um, I thank you guys for being vulnerable and sharing your experiences. I know it's kind of a private issue that we bring out into public, but I think it's going to help a lot of people. And uh, I love you both. Love so, you too. Uh, Marcus, nice you. to meet you. Hey, nice to meet you. Yeah. All right. <laughs> Good to see you guys. Take care. <laughs>